This is the site that Dan McCarthy discovered. This is the new site, a little one here, and another one up there that I just discovered last December. Because I went to visit his site, I got curious, and it said, water in left-hand gulch, about 200 yards, JV 1873. Now, Dan McCarthy recorded that because it was along the trail, but he didn't go look for the water. He just was concentrating on the trail, so recorded this little site, found the boundaries, nothing was outside of those boundaries, so he moved on down the trail. Well, when I went out to record this, I took some volunteers out, me, out with me, and I gave everybody a, a few tasks to do, and they all got busy, and I'm thinking, I'm gonna walk up the wash about 200 yards and see if I can find water. Now, this is December, and uh, it hadn't rained in some time. Uh, we got most of our rains after this visit. But uh, here's some of the other uh, rocks from that site. A couple of petroglyphs, a rock ring. Can you see it? Is it uh, too small? <laughs> see all these little petroglyphs in here? I had to get this far away to get the whole rock. But uh, if I had a human standing there, it'd be about this tall. Mm, wow. So somebody had to climb up on those rocks. And I have some close-ups of it, too. Yeah, I have no idea what's happening. Uh, this was that other real small dot. Had the human figures. And then looking at these bighorn sheep, the human figures are right on the other side of this rock. So um, as I was walking up the wash, I saw the human figures. And I took a couple of photos. And, oh, this is pretty cool. Took some photos, and then I started to walk away, and then I thought, and I turned around and looked back, and then I saw a bighorn sheep around the other side. And bighorn sheep are, uh, <coughs> petroglyphs are very rare in the lower uh, Colorado desert. You see them all the time up in northern San Bernardino County and uh, up in the Coso Ranges. They're everywhere, but they're very rare down here. Now they, they, these are close-ups of that big wall. Uh, this guy's got a problem. Looks like somebody stuck him. <laughs> uh, then we have some interesting looking, uh, what we call digitated anthropomorphs in the jargon. Uh, and uh, splayed fingers and toes. But some interesting, it, it looks like this would tell me a story. Uh, I have no idea what the story says, but it involves a person. And, uh, <laughs> a bridge. And then these people here are not quite, you know, the 90 degree bend. They're kind of a little different uh, uh, style. So I think it's probably a different person, different artist. Uh, and these here, straight down at an angle, a little, another different artist. Then you have like a menorah, and of course they're now interpreting it for our culture. Uh, we don't really know what they meant. I'm sure the lost tribes of Israel were not. There. <laughs> and talking about a menorah. Yeah. Happy holidays. Oh, let me go back. Wow, let me go back. These uh, ground level that I was standing on was just a little bit below this. And uh, I'm standing on the gravel, taking the photos of this big wall. And I look over where the water would have just come down. Uh, and it probably dropped about six feet. And uh, I saw some critter had dug a little hole. It's probably only six, eight inches in diameter and about eight ten, eight, 10 inches deep. Look down and there's water in it. So this whole area that I'm standing on, there's water just a few inches deep. This is another Tanaha, 
that it filled up with gravel, it was nice and level, but the animals smelled that water and went for it. Now humans don't have that keen sense of smell, so the petroglyphs say, there's water here. <laughs> and we, we see wherever these natural tanks, there's petroglyphs all over the place. So now I look at it a little differently. I look at the petroglyphs, there must be water here. So. And uh, sure enough, there is. And I, some of these petroglyphs actually went down below the gravel. So I grabbed my trusty little archaeologist trowel, scraped it away to see how deep the uh, petroglyphs extended below the gravel level. Then it went down about four or five inches. But I noticed the ground was very damp as I got down there. And this is uh, probably 20, 30 feet away from where the animal had dug and found water. So that means that whole, there's a swimming pool sized tank of water below my feet. I don't know how deep it went, but maybe someday I'll go out there and find out. On our hike out from this uh, in the afternoon, getting the sunset on the, uh, those are the Little Maria Mountains off in the distance. And uh, this is in the uh, Palin McCoy Wilderness. Beautiful place, I'll be going out there again here in a month or so. Uh, this is taken from a uh, book that was published by Elizabeth Crozer Campbell back in 1935 of the Pinto Wash, or the Pinto Basin site in Joshua Tree. So if you've all been up Joshua Tree, you know where the Pinto Basin is. Uh, the Campbells recorded that site in 19, well they published in 1935, so they recorded the site before that. And uh, these are some of the points, styles that showed up uh, that they discovered. Now we're finding those same points all over the Chukwala Valley. So it's a continuation of the same Pinto culture. There's a Pinto point right there. That was from Fort Dry Lake. And that is now curated in the San Bernardino Museum because of the solar project. It would have been ruined by a road grader or a, those big belly scrapers. They had to terrace the land, so any artifacts that they discovered collected in the museum. And that's, that's the Ford Dry Lake there, and that's the Genesis Project. Uh, Pinto Basin is way up here. Uh, yeah, way up here. So. Pinto Wash comes down here, flows into Palin Dry Lake, goes into Ford Dry Lake, and that's the lowest place. So the watershed for Ford Dry Lake is huge. Basically along this side of the Chukwala Mountains, this side of the Maria Mountains, coming down between the McCoy and Palin, coming down this way, coming down this way, and coming from here. All the water would end up there if it didn't sink into the ground first. And of course, beautiful downtown Blythe. Now these are, uh, uh, if you walk out to the Ford Dry Lake Playa today, and you're in, you're in the right spot, you see all these uh, artifacts. This looks just like a rock, but it's fire affected rock. It was broken and stained from fire. Uh, this is a, uh, a mono fragment or a hand stone, grinding stone. And then uh, these are all artifacts in, this, in a scatter. To look at the uh, facing northeast. Okay. So that's still on the Ford Dry Lake Playa. Um, this is an interesting artifact here. It was once a Lake Mojave point that broke off. Then thousands of years later, another uh, Native American, uh, prehistoric Native American, found that and flaked this edge right up here into a scraper. They have a nice little scraper with a handle on it that is made of uh, a stone called chert. 
do we have that uh, Pinto point from earlier? This is another Lake Mojave point. Uh, Lake Mojave points are known because of this long handle, and that would be inside a, a hafted shaft. And then it had a little shoulders, uh, but as it was used, uh, like, a, like a spear point, as it was used, and maybe the tip broke off, they resharpened it. Maybe it broke off again, they resharpened it. And it broke again, and they resharpened it. Till it got down to almost nothing, like this little guy here. And then it was just tossed. And then they made a new, big one. And they used it down, used it down, wore it down until uh, it was very, very short. And uh, all of the, stuff back, practically that whole stone was in the hafting of the shaft. So that was the tip sticking out right there. All that was in the haft. Okay, this was a, uh, we have another project that is still going through the environmental process near Mule Mountains. It's called the Desert Quartzite Solar Plant. And uh, it hasn't been approved yet, but I suspect it will pretty soon. Um, beautiful material. It's a chalcedony. Uh, you see it's got a break in it. The, uh, we walked out to the site and found the tip. And then we hiked out into the project area, looked around, and then as we circled around and came back about 100 yards away, we found the base, and I said, hey, that looks like the same material as that other piece we found. So we went over, picked it up, fit like a glove. <laughs> that happens more often than you think, really. It's, it's amazing uh, how many times I've seen something like that. Yeah, it looked just like the other piece that was over there. This is a Lake Mojave point, and the Lake Mojave points are probably between eight and 10,000 years old. That's when, they, uh, when they're find, found in datable context, that's the range of dates that they're uh, carbon-14 dated to. So it's a relative to the carbon that they're found with. This one was uh, not found in a datable context, but a uh, Fresno City College went out there to do a, to record a, uh, an area, to survey an area and to record any sites they found there as a field school for students. And uh, they found and recorded this. I'm still looking for it. That's the problem with collecting things. If you don't take them right to the museum and curate them, we don't know what happens to them after 10, 15 years, people retire, people move on. Uh, and it's, that's why it's very important to keep good records and curate in a uh, curation facility that is reputable. Okay, here's uh, these two red pieces here. It's Jasper. That is the base of a Clovis point. And I was lucky enough to find that uh, near McCoy Mountains in this area right here uh, as I was hiking back from the Foy Springs uh, we had just hiked about 14 miles of course this is winter so it's kind of nice it's probably 78 80 degrees that day but my feet were tired I just hiked about 14 miles and I could see the car out in the distance and I know in the car I have this ice chest full of Gatorade and uh, cold water and I've got my backpack has a little bladder in it and the water is hot so I'm thinking oh I can't wait to get back to that water and I could see it and I look down and there's this guy laying there that's laying just as I found it and I knew exactly what it was as soon as I saw it and I know I I just can't keep walking I gotta stop and put that cold Gatorade on hold. So I got down, recorded it, photographed it, GPSed it, collected it, and then went, rewarded myself with a cold Gatorade. And this is along that trail as well. 
is one of the rocks along the, on the, along the trail where you see um, petroglyphs quite often. And I sent this off to the, the California Clovis expert in, uh, up in San Francisco area. And he confirmed that uh, uh, it was what I thought it was. And uh, like I said, we now accept pre clovis site dates to 14.5, like the, the stem point I showed you earlier. And the theory now that archaeologists are looking at is Clovis dates, the earliest Clovis dates, are in Florida. So that land bridge theory kind of doesn't look like it makes much sense anymore. Because the Clovis technology spread from the southeast to the northwest, across the Great Basin, uh, and or across the uh, Midwest into the Great Basin, and to the coast. Um, but the the, the uh, stemmed points, like they found at Paisley Cave, they're saying came from not the land bridge, but by marine canoes island hopping the Aleutian Islands down the coast, of, uh, west coast of the uh, United States, and down into South America, and then spread east, because the oldest dates for stem points are on the west coast. So it's two technologies that merged and passed. And again, back to the map. Uh, let me remember why I put this slide there, so we'll all skip on it. And uh, a little friend of mine that showed up on a site. Oh, yeah, it looks like that. <laughs> so, any questions? Thank you. Actually, not a particular tribe, but a, a group of tribes. This area, uh, Kroeber back in 1925, when he was going around talking to all the tribes and uh, finding out where their territory boundaries were, uh, they're just kind of vague boundaries. Well, this area, nobody really claimed, but everyone used it for resources. Since it had all the trails going through it, uh, there's pretty much an unbroken trail system that you can find little pieces of it along the way from Santa Monica to the Rio Grande. And it runs right through this area. So any tribes that were moving from the Rio Grande to the Pacific, uh, doing trade, travel, uh, trading, trading uh, stone resources, baskets, uh, food, Whatever they traded, they used these trails to trade with other groups. So uh, since the trails are uh, very common in this area on the desert pavements, we have a lot of uh, uh, 